I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm very excited to share a Patreon training from one year ago titled Verifying Residential Load Calculations. Obviously, this pertains to Manual J from ACA. In this training with my Patreon members, I actually walk through some of the key points to pull off of your summary pages from your load calcs. We talk about what adequate exposure diversity is and what to do with those charts as well as how to select the correct duct insulation and leakage ratings in your manual J load calculation. Hope you enjoy and everybody learn something. A couple things I want to point out. That is a picture of where I am right now, obviously. Uh, actually, very close to the same weather. Um, you can see this is a, a printout of our property card. So property cards are public domain, right? You can go to any town assessor's website and most likely print off a property card. If you've taken my site survey course, you've heard me talk at length about this. But what I wanna point out is if you're doing a block load calculation, when you're verifying a load calculation, uh, a manual J version eight uh, report out of any of the approved software, having this to accompany it will really help you understand if you missed anything, particularly uh, south facing walls when you're talking about uh, cooling loads. Uh, or you know just uh, completely missed overhangs like my porch. So uh, make sure you have at least a sketch. Uh, obviously the town assessors do this for you so I would recommend you take advantage of their labor. Um, it's what you're paying for. So highly recommend doing that. Of course if you're doing a room by room load calculation having the zone by zone or room by room breakout will really help you identify if you missed any windows, if you missed uh, significant outside walls for that room. So make sure you have that floor plan available. And one thing I always forgot, and I usually use uh, Google Maps to verify it uh, every time I did forget, uh, is the direction of north. And I would always orientate that with the front door just so I knew which way all of those windows and everything faced on my floor plan. So really simple. If you forget, go to Google Maps. North always pops up facing north, uh, up, right? And you can verify which way that, uh, that floor plan is facing. Um, and it does impact the load. So really important. I want to make sure people are actually getting the correct direction, not the direction that pro provides the highest load. I've seen people change that compass on, uh, let's say, right soft and uh, just go with the highest, which is not correct. All right. Um, we want to get the real loads for that home. And in order to verify it, we have to have that right. All right. So just to, uh, to let you know today, I'm gonna cover reports out of the most popular software programs that I see locally here, which is WriteSoft and uh, CoolCalc. Uh, a lot of the other reports are very, very similar. I just picked two because I'm a little limited in time today. Um, if you were using a different software and you're not sure what some of this information is, please, if, especially if you're an elite member on uh, our Patreon page, reach out to me or talk to me during our one-on-one -on -one monthly and I'm more than happy to point out where you can find and verify this information. So most people, especially here in the Northeast, are using WriteSoft. It's a design suite. I'm concentrating on the Manual J reports out of that today. Uh, there is AdTech or Elite Software, which is typically uh, more of a, uh, when you're doing data entry, it's more of a worksheet style as opposed to drawing out the floor plan. So it's a little tougher on verification. And actually a lot of our local building inspectors have a tougher time using those style reports. They really love WriteSoft because it's very easy to verify. Of course, Carmel is an Apple, uh, an Apple iOS uh, software device, so you would use it on an iPad. Um, it's very simple, just like the other uh, software, AdTech and Elite, it is, uh, you know, uh, checklist based, you're gonna be entering in the wall, what's on the wall, is it uh, a window, a door, right? Uh, what the installation value is, which direction it face, okay, on to the next wall. So it's very simple in that, in that aspect. It's a little tougher on Carmel to do a room by room load calculation. You would basically do a block load first and then start deducting all of those walls and all of the other rooms to do a room by room. So it's a little bit of extra work compared to some of the other software. Avenir is actually a 3D modeling software that does load calculations. It's really sweet, very expensive. I personally don't have any uh, experience on it. it. It is relatively new to the ACA Manual J version eight approved softwares. Um, and then the last one on here, which is actually free to use, you just have to pay if you want reports out of it, is CoolCalc. 
Um, it's Manual J version 8, approved by ACA. Any of the reports that come out of ACA in order to be used for most rebate programs and to qualify for building permits or uh, you know, uh, local code, you're gonna have to make sure it has the logo in the middle of this slide. It says powered by ACA Manual J. Uh, if you're not sure if your software is eligible, first off, it should be listed here. Um, but if you're watching this later on down the road and something else got approved, you can always go to acca.org backslash standards backslash approve hyphen software or obviously click on standards on their website and click on approve software that'll get you that page so really really simple but like i said today i'm going to concentrate on the reports out of write soft and cool Cal. so when we get that summary page the summary page is really great for you to wa start walking through the rest of the system design process. We need the information off of this summary page to then select the equipment, to th and then of course the details pages to then uh, start designing our duct system if we're doing a new duct system or verify, all right? So we need to verify the basics to make sure we got everything correct before we submit this for a rebate or before we submit this for code purposes or before we size the equipment and realize we made a mistake, all right? Especially if these numbers are low, you wanna make sure you didn't miss anything on here. So uh, we're not adding things, we're making sure we're verifying that it's correct. So first off, I would say very simply, uh, verify the outdoor design temps. Uh, these should match table 1A or depending on if you're in uh, certain microclimates in the United States, table 1B out of manual J version eight. If you are a, a VIP or an elite member and you have access to all of my manual J and S training, uh, in the first couple of the videos, so we're talking about the first 10 videos in my series for system design, they start one dot and the name of it. Obviously it's progressive, so two, three. Um, I believe in the first couple is uh, outdoor design temperatures. And if you're working in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, I give you all those design temperatures right in that presentation. You don't have to go look it up in, um, in the actual Manual J uh, book. Uh, of course, if you're using software, if you select the correct data city, the location city for weather. So in this example, we selected Lowell, Massachusetts. Design temperatures for Lowell is actually the highest in cooling for Massachusetts or Rhode Island. It's 88 degrees outside and one degree in heating for winter design conditions. That's the 99% design temperatures, right? So we verify that that matches and that's gonna uh, meet code requirements. Then of course, we're gonna look at indoor design temperatures. And if you're familiar with some of the blogs I put out over years past, I talk about what is code, right? So the, the uh, International Energy Conservation Code and the Residential Code actually establishes what your indoor design temperatures need to be. It's very strict in cooling, 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity, okay? In heating, you're allowed 70 degrees plus or minus two. So you could be as high as 72 inside, as low as 68, all right? That's the range that's allowed. Most people just stick with 70 and allow for that drift. So in heating, you'll see inside on the left-hand side of the summary page, it's circled 70 degrees inside, 75 dry bulb on summer design conditions on the right, and of course, 50% relative humidity. The delta across indoor and outdoor is really what matters here. If I selected a crazy temperature um, of let's say designing to 70 degrees inside in summer, all right? But I also reduced my outdoor design conditions by another five degrees and I sized to 83, I would come up with the same load. It's all about temperature difference and moisture difference across those walls and windows and doors, all right? So very, very important, it's the delta across that. You need to know what you're working with for those deltas. And that's the 1% or 99% design temperatures and the difference across there, okay? So in this example, we're designing to a 69 degree design temperature difference in winter, 13 degrees in summer, okay? Uh, and then of course, we're gonna take a look at, you know, some of the basics. So your uh, square footage, right? Um, so down on the bottom left, is the square footage within, let's say 5% of what is actually listed on the town assessor's website. If it's off by more than that, then your local code inspector is probably gonna call you on it. You most likely missed something or added something or there's an addition that was never accounted for, right? I'm sure that comes up with some homeowners. So make sure it matches um, based on what you are actually heating and cooling, okay? Um, it should match the town assessor's website. And then uh, the actual heat loss, right? So the equipment load under heating summary is the heat loss that you're gonna be sizing to. On the cooling side, you're gonna write down your total cooling gain. So in this example it was 34,783. 
but in order to select the correct equipment, you also need to break that down to the sensible load. So in this case is 31092 and the latent load 3691. When you add that up, that equals your total. All right. We need to separate that so we can select the correct equipment in order to remove moisture. If we can't get the total latent gain out of the home, that air conditioner is never going to work. All right. So very important. We keep track of this and those three pieces of information, the heat, the total heat loss, the total heat gain, and then broken down is what we need to track. And what I did was on your, um, the link for this webinar. And of course I always post the recorded version of this. I actually added a PDF called the scorecard. This is what I used to use in the design process. So I didn't have to keep going back and looking for the, that information off those summary pages. I would just write it down for that project, my heat loss, my sensible heat gain, my latent heat gain, add the two together is my total. It should all match what's on the load. And then you can see on that scorecard, we walk through the manual S equipment selection process and the pertinent information for manual D. So really easy, keep track of it, put in your job folder, or whoever, whatever you're gonna be doing as a product manager or whatever it is, that way you can always refer back to it um, if there is a question without having to sift through all those other documents or if it gets deleted off your computer or you get a new computer, right? I've been there. So make sure you keep track of that information. Sounds basic, really important. So if I'm gonna verify a load calculation, I don't just get the summary page. The devil is really in the details, right? We need to make sure we didn't miss anything or it's correct information that went in. And when we look at these details pages, you can see this is just the entire house. If I had a room by room or a zone by zone off of manual J details pages for WriteSoft, that would be the column next to entire house. It would be first floor, second floor, or whatever bedroom or whatever room it's named, okay? You can see here my total room area, 2319, that's the square footage of the home in this example. And then as I go down on the left-hand side, the type, W stands for wall, G stands for glass, C is ceiling, P is a partition, um, D is door, right? So very basic there. And then they're gonna tell you the construction numbers and that's what's pulling the U values out of the software, okay? What I'm gonna look for are the major things. Things that say zero, make sure I didn't miss it, right? Or glass that faces south, make sure there's not some crazy number. I've seen some guys actually make some mistakes. All glass gets entered into software in feet, not inches. So uh, 24 by 36 or 48 window, if you enter 24 by 48, they think it's 24 feet by 48 feet. It's really two by four, okay? So two feet by four feet. So make sure you don't mess that up and see really large values there. And then I also see a lot of mistakes with ceiling U values. Always look under U values to see if you have a, a, a U value greater than 0.1. So if the number is greater than 0.1, that means you have an R value less than 10, right? Because uh, U value is the inverse of the R value. So um, as an example, 0.1 is an R value of 10, is 10, right? This particular ceiling, the largest uh, gross area is 778 has a U value of 0 0.032. That's an R26, okay? So now we're getting really close to what you should have in a ceiling. Um, so really important, you wanna verify this. Of course, if this is new construction, it should match what's on the plans, right? It's, it's very simple on that end. Um, on retrofits, that's where you're gonna have to actually measure these things. And like I said, if you're a VIP or an elite member, you're gonna have access to my site survey course, which walks through how to identify all of that, all right? Um, you can access and watch those videos at any time. So uh, next page you're gonna find, or I'm sorry, following further down on the page, because these pages are they're pretty small print. I blew this up so you can see them. Um, the details page is continued. I would take a look at internal gains. I would say the number one thing that I see mistakes is number of people. Either they miss people or they put too many because they add one for every bedroom and then one in the kitchen and then one, and they just put them everywhere. They should be the number of bedrooms plus one and where the people will be at 4 or 5 p.m. during peak demand. That's where they should be, all right? Um, of course, if you're just doing a block load, it's the total number, very simple. And then take a look at appliance loads. Really, if you have anything more than 2,400 BTUs for appliance or, or internal gains that are not people, so appliances slash other, you probably need to justify it, all right? So remember, all of these adjustments are for devices or lighting or utility rooms or a dryer or whatever it is, a washer uh, that is operating at peak demand. So during four or 5 p.m. here in the Northeast, okay? So uh, any internal gains is what's gonna affect the heat gain 
Uh, you don't have to worry about that on a heat loss exclusively, right? So really important in this example, we had 3,800 for internal gains. That's a large appliance load. Uh, maybe in, in this example, there's multiple kitchens, uh, utility room, unvented uh, washer, uh, or a dishwasher, I mean. Um, maybe uh, canned lights in the kitchen that don't have dimmers, that are not LED, right? So all of these things have adjustments within Manual J, and there's tables for those adjustments, and they should be added. In your software, like in this example, WriteSoft doesn't exclusively say what all of these things are for when you make the adjustments. There's just total adjustments, so 800 for a utility room. Um, you need to know what's in the utility room and if it's running at 4 or 5 p.m., all right? Um, and then, of course, duck loads. Make sure you take a look at the duck loads. In this case, 40% uh, of my uh, load is in duck loads. That's a large duck load. I'm willing to bet this is an attic-based system. Um, you can see 18,000, well, a little over 18,000 BTU heat loss on the, on the duct work. Probably needs to be sealed and insulated. So it looks like we're doing a retrofit with an existing duct system. And a little over 10,500 BTUs in cooling. Um, that's a lot of gains. Now, what if I made a mistake and it was really a ductless system going in here? We just oversized the heck out of that unit, right? We added a ton, ton and a half for no reason. So ductless systems should be smaller than ducted systems. It's accounted for in the load calculation, all right? So pretty cut and dry. Those are the major things to look for to make sure you don't miss anything. So when I'm looking at CoolCalc, CoolCalc gives you the same information, just in a different format. The one thing I like about CoolCalc is all of that summary stuff is given to you in a quick chart. So in this case, these are all the cooling loads and I can take a quick look to see if I see any, see any zeros or numbers that are really low or really high. So duck gains, if my duck gains are above 15 or 20%, if it's more than that of the load, either I missed something significant in the load, which drove up the duck gains, or I said I had a leaky duct system and I didn't. I just really knew and it's gonna be tight. So really important you take a look at what is odd in that report, okay? Anything missing. So things like ventilation, there are zeros in this particular report. If I have an ERV or an HRV, or I'm bringing in ventilation air somehow in the house and I'm not accounting for it, you can see how my load calculation wouldn't be correct. So look for those obvious pieces, just like we always look for outdoor design temperatures, indoor design temps, square footage no matter what report we're looking at, it's all in there. And that's why it's ACA approved, okay? Um, same thing with CoolCalc on the heating side, they give you a chart and you can see what the gains, um, in this case, losses on heating. Um, and make sure you don't miss anything. So as an example here, I have zeros for skylights. There's no skylights in this house um, or uh, below grade walls. If I actually had finished basement with below grade walls and I didn't account for that heat loss, all right, it's probably not gonna be a lot if it's below grade, but it's something. And if we don't account for it, it might not be comfortable when we get below design temperatures, right? It's not gonna be able to keep up because we sized it at our design temps without that heat loss. So really important to make sure you don't avoid any of the obvious stuff here. And you can see here, um, this particular uh, ducted system had about 10,000 BTUs. You can see we kind of matched the cool calc versus the right stuff for this example here. Another piece I want to focus on, uh, and a lot of people just glaze over this, uh, no pun intended, um, the AED excursion graph. So AED is adequate exposure diversity. It's talking about the glass in the home, all right? And if there's any peaks in this, in this house, anything over 1.5, so anything more than 50% above the total load means you need to zone this home. Okay, so you can see here that green line is average. That red line is the 150% max in this example. And really uh, anything over 1.3 should be zoned. Um, if you have a peak, that means at, in this example, somewhere around 3 p.m., so 1500, if you, those of you who are in the military, you know 1500 is about 3 p.m. Um, you can see we're gonna have a go above in some rooms, the allowance for the average fenestration load. And that means there's gonna be rooms in the home that are not comfortable in order to cool the entire house, okay? So one peak means at three, at four or five, uh, 3 p.m. in this example, I need to zone off those rooms that are facing, let's say, west or south, right? It's pretty obvious here. The rest of the rooms would be on the other zone. Sometimes you have multiple peaks, all right? In this example, if you have two peaks, that means you have rooms with dissimilar loads throughout the day. 
Um, maybe you have, uh, you're on the water and you have a lot of glass that face uh, east in the morning and we have a 9 a.m. peak. And then also when the sun sets on the other side of the house, there's a lot of glass that faces the other side and there's a peak at 4 or 5 p.m. In this case, we would group the correct rooms together in order to zone that house. Now, of course, uh, I'd probably prefer to zone, you know, with equipment, but if you can, then you would zone with uh, ductwork, right? So you'd put a, a ducted zoning system in. Um, really important, uh, typically if you see two peaks, it's probably east and west. Um, if you see one peak, it's probably just a lot of south-facing glass. Um, if you don't zone, then your temperatures within that house or that floor will actually vary more than three degrees, and that's what causes comfort problems, partic particularly during peak demand time. And that's those callbacks. That means the system wasn't designed right. We didn't look at the load calc and look at the AED excursion graph and say, oh, Mrs. Jones, we need to zone the system if you wanna be comfortable. Maybe that's the, the best option, include zoning. Um, but at least you set the expectation and they don't pay for it. And now it's not your fault when it's 99 degrees outside and it's a four or five degree temperature difference throughout the home, okay? You gotta address that on the front end. You can see here, this is a, uh, another AED excursion graph out of CoolCalc, um, very similar. Anything over 1.3 should have zoning. Anything over 1.5 has to have zoning, okay? Um, and then we talked about uh, design temperatures already. What I really wanna point out is know your market. Most of you guys are working in the same area. You should know what your design temperatures are. Um, really, if you're in Mass Rhode Island, anything above a 15 degree delta in summer means you're oversizing the equipment. Anything more than a 73 degree delta, no matter where you are in Massachusetts, even out in Pittsfield, Mass, uh, means you're oversizing that system and heating. That is the maximum temperature difference. So the highest is 88 in Lowell in the summertime, coldest is negative three in Pittsfield. Um, any temperatures above or below that, you're oversizing your system for no reason and it won't meet code or rebate requirements. Um, Really important to understand and explain to the homeowner why those temperatures, because I know I've, I've had it, where you design a system at 75 degrees and the homeowner says, why 75? I want it 70, I want 72 in cooling. Um, you gotta explain to them what happens, right? Um, very important to understand grains of moisture and relative humidity. They're not gonna be comfortable when they drive that temperature down. And I like to explain this using a glass, right? The glass itself would be your dry bulb temperature. The amount of water in the glass relative to the total amount, relative humidity would be the amount of water in the glass or your wet bulb temperature, okay? So if your amount of moisture in the glass is above 50% relative humidity, it's gonna feel very clammy. It's gonna, it's gonna be moisture in the air. You're not gonna be comfortable. What a lot of people do is start turning the temperature down and that gets the system to run longer to remove more moisture so you feel cooler, right? Really important. Um, that you don't oversize the system and always have that condition. Um, and it's really important that they don't keep cranking the temperature down and create that condition, right? Because if I make the glass smaller, the dry bulb temperature, and I don't remove moisture out at the same rate, if it's oversized or it's running on max cooling or whatever it is, they're not gonna be comfortable, okay? And they're not gonna, um, first off, meet code requirements. Um, but it also creates a situation where things can grow that we don't want to grow, like mold or viruses, right? So really important. In order for indoor air quality to work, we have to have the right conditions. Also, this allows room for drift. So on those above or below design days in heating and cooling, um, we can be comfortable in the summertime at 77, 78 degrees if it's drier, okay? We've all felt that. I felt that today. It was 78 degrees outside today. It was awesome. Felt really, felt really dry because it's the fall. Oh, well, just barely the other day. All right. Um, and then in heating, same thing. If it's really, really cold outside, we all get those cold weekends in February up here. Um, we can, uh, if the furnace can't keep up, we can add moisture to the air with a humidifier and it'll feel warmer. Okay. So really important that a uh, homeowner knows the expectation, what we're designing around and why. All right. Not just, hey, 75 is what it is. And you tell them after the fact when they complain. Okay. Um, when you're looking at our value in ceilings, a ceiling, especially when it comes to heat loss, is really a huge area, all right? And that can impact your load the most uh, when you talk about heat loss. So really important, you get the R value correct for that ceiling. Now this is actually my attic upstairs, um, a great picture. It was professionally blown in 
and you can see it's nice and flat and even, even after I had some people run some wires. I had them fix it all, okay? Um, if it was peaks and valleys, we don't really have an effective R value of, let's say, R38. Uh, because of all the voids and all the, um, all the area that's not filled um, and air movement, you probably have an effective R value of maybe R19, all right? Just 2% voids can reduce the R value in half, okay? Um, but if it's a new ceiling, you should be looking at at least R32 in our area now based on the 2015 IECC. That's new construction code. So any new ceiling is at least R32. And then one other mistake I see a lot of people make, they don't know because they don't measure maybe the leakage of the duct system. Um, so I want to give you the equivalent losses versus what the options are for manual J. So you can see here on the right hand side, Manual J options are extreme, notable, average, partially, and unsealed. Everybody knows when it's unsealed. You can see that. Um, if you were measuring it and you know the leakage rate, you could get the right number. Basically, uh, in anybody that's on the 2015 or newer IECC, uh, which is the code for duct testing, you can leak no more than 4% at 25 uh, pascals per 100 square feet that the unit services. So no more than 4%. Right, four CFM per hundred square feet. Uh, that equates to notable on the manual J options. So a new duct system going in will at least be notable. If you're sealing a system up with, um, you know, the the uh, I forget the name of it, the the sealing systems that you can blow the sealant on the inside of the duct work, and as it leaks, it seals the system. You get down to like single digit CFM values for for leakage. That is going to be extreme. Okay. Um, or if you're testing it and you know it's less than 1.8%, I would mark it extreme then. Um, you know the abilities of your installation teams and the tools that you have. Uh, but if for code, you're at least notable on a new duct system. Um, average, partially sealed. Um, if you're not measuring, it's a guess. All right. So I uh, highly recommend you measure, but it's expensive and it takes time. And you're probably not going to do that on a sales call. Um, but on a... Uh, uh, a further investigation before you put a new ducted system into an existing duct ductwork situation, you may want to test it. That way you get the load right. All right. And then of course, insulation, right? So if you're up in an attic, um, it's vented to outside R8. If you're within the envelope, uh, your supply should be R6. If everything is all within the thermal envelope, you actually don't have to uh, put insulation or even test it. Um, but if you don't, you know what happens with an air conditioner, right? If the temperature outside, uh, temperature of the duct gets below the dew point of the air, uh, then it sweats. So I would put insulation on no matter what. And then don't forget to include window shading. There's a reason I have a nice, well, not just because I use it all the time, and this is part of the main reason I bought my house, but beautiful farmer's porch across almost all three sides, right? That face south and west. Um, I love it, okay? But if I didn't include that porch, those overhangs, my glass would have huge gains that face that way. I have a nice, beautiful picture window you can see to the right of my front door. Um, that is probably six feet by four feet. Um, and if I didn't include that overhang, oh my goodness, that's probably a half a ton to a ton right there. Um, but when I put the overhang in, because of the shading, drops it way down to what reality is. Also fireplaces, particularly old houses like mine, um, they have uh, vented fireplaces that are just wide open. I have to put a pillow in there in the winter time, right? The, the blow up pillows um, in order to stop that air leakage. If you don't and you don't account for that, huge heat loss. And it just starts, uh, the heat starts pulling that cold air in. It's like natural ventilation. So very important you account for these things. Now, if you had sealed combustion fireplaces, that's not gonna impact the load very much. Um, so look for these uh, obvious op uh, issues. Um, don't avoid them. I know it's a little extra step in your software to enter it correctly, but now you're going to have the right load and you're going to be able to size the duct work right and size the equipment right. So what did you think of the training? If you liked it, please make sure you subscribe for future trainings every time I post a video just below me here by ringing the bell. Also, if you like this one year in advance, you can always join my Patreon page for as little as $8 a month. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody either there or back here on my YouTube channel where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.